Tony Ferguson is an animal. Yeah. An animal. Like that. He's the scariest guy at 155, in my, in my word. I, I agree. In my world. Because he don't so. get tired. Yeah. He, it, that cowboy fight freaked me out. He what? Cowboy looked like Tony had bricks in his gloves. Yeah. His face was all busted up. Tony didn't look like he had a scratch on him. And Tony wasn't even tired. Tony posted a meme, I feel like, a couple days ago. He showed, like, his last seven opponents. Yeah, they're all fucked up. Yeah. Like, they, they all fell off a train. Yeah. Regardless of the era you are looking at, the industry of mixed martial arts was always rich with vivid talents and high-spirited warriors to the core of their bones who entered the octagon with a kill or be killed motto and every single time try to make the best impression with their performances. However, over time even the most enduring athletes and those who were absolutely unbeatable in the eyes of the fans begin to go downhill and lose. And today we're going to talk about such cases. Please don't forget about the likes, comments with four words and subscribe to the channel. Here we go. Number one, Dan Hooker. I'm gonna announce my next fight. Dustin Poirier, I'm gonna smash your face in. Meet me in New Zealand, 2020, and I'm gonna end you. For a long time, Dan Hooker had a big potential for a successful career in the world's best league. After moving to the lightweight class, the New Zealander delivered flashy performances and with mixed success, was getting closer to the coveted top five. The last at that moment lost to Edson Barbosa via TKO on December the 15th of 2018, eventually led to the young prospect to a three-fight winning streak and that notable call-out of the diamond for the contender's fight. To many people's surprise, the matchmakers liked the idea and put this intriguing fight as the main event at UFC on ESPN 12 on June the 27th of 2020. As you remember, Dustin beat the promising guy with a great advantage and earned a unanimous decision win in a dominant fashion. You gonna smash my face? You gonna fight Gatesy Nugs? You fight me? Hey, okay. hey you're on the right track. Keep working, all right? Hey, look, look at this. Keep working, all right? <laughs> Apart from a precious health, Poirier also took Hooker's heart. He beat him up so badly that the New Zealander lost all his potential and will to win, which went hand in hand with him throughout his whole career. Hey, everyone. Just back at the hotel with the lads, having a feed. Uh, I got checked out of the hospital, everything's all good. Just a couple of stitches on the eye. But uh, hey, that's the game we play, no worries. Uh, it's just a small step back and I'll be back. After a devastating loss to Diamond, Dan Hooker got an opportunity to face Michael Chandler, who transitioned from Bellator and was looking to break into the top of the lightweight division. In the fight itself, it could be seen how confused and perhaps even scared the fighter looked. The Iron One finished the New Zealander via TKO already in the middle of the first round. The interesting thing is that Chandler happened to be the first fighter who knocked Dan Hooker out with a punch straight to the jaw. Prior to that, the New Zealander was able to take even the most destructive bombs. After that, Dan Hooker tried to get himself together and beat Nazrat Hakparaz via unanimous decision at UFC 266. It seemed like Hooker would soon return to the previous positions. However, then he had two more stoppage losses to Islam Makachev and Arnold Allen. The most recent performance of a once promising prospect happened on November the 12th at UFC 281. In that fight, Hooker managed to stop Claudio Puyes in the second round. However, his previous performances and his age speak for themselves. It's sad to admit, but Dan Hooker will not come back to the previous level. Number 2. Ben Askren Hey Dana, is that really the best you got? Bring him, baby! The situation with Ben Askren is similar, but still, it's a little bit different. The bigger part of the American fighter's professional career took place within the walls of various local leagues where the opposition, frankly speaking, was significantly inferior to the top athletes from the world's best league. However, it's worth noting that from February of 2009 to 2019, Ben Askren has been performing quite successfully and stayed undefeated. Moreover, the only reason Askren found himself in the new organization is due to a transfer with another fighter. Ben's debut performance took place on March the 2nd of 2019 at UFC 235. The one to welcome him in the new place was Robbie Lawler, 
already a veteran of this sport with some residues of his erstwhile berserker power. Good old Lawler was ruthlessly beating a former 1FC fighter up for half a round. In one of the sequences, he even knocked Askren out with a powerful throw and then woke him up trying to finish the job. Though with a squeak, it was Askren who won the fight because of the referee's mistake, who thought Robbie fell asleep due to a bulldog choke. In fact, it became clear that Askren was not good enough to deal with the opposition of the world's best league. The following fights only worsened his situation. However, it was the fight with Street Jesus that crushed Askren's ego. I could do anything to me. It's totally impossible. I will do whatever I want to this person. I will dominate them. I will humiliate them. And when I grabbed George, even though I was only two months into my MMA, MMA career with no fights, that's how I felt about him. I just saw him right now and I address him like a man and he gets all nervous and he can't spur the moment start talking. You know, I'm sure he's going to go home, think about something to say on some posts and then repost it. But when we're right here live in the flesh, nothing to say, you know, and it's not personal to me. It's always business, but um, I'm happy I get to bust this guy in the face and get paid for it. A little bit happier than most times, I can tell you that much. A lot happier than most times. As you remember, it was all over after five seconds by a deep knockout. George broke Ben in every sense possible. I saw some criticism. People say the punches weren't really necessary. Maybe they were super necessary. <laughs> why were they necessary? What do you mean, why were they not necessary? Because he was already knocked out at that point. But it, the referee hadn't pulled me off. And my job is to hit somebody till the referee pulls me off. So to those people, I would say, maybe don't watch him and may go back to soccer. And a subsequent defeat to Damien Meyer by submission choke in the third round ultimately put Askren in a retirement house. After finishing his career, the American managed to dig the hole even deeper and went boxing, where he lost to Jake Paul by knockout. Number 3. Cody Garbrandt But uh, I'm the champion now. I'm the badass dude in my division, so I call the shots. The career of Cody Garbrandt pretty much resembles the ride on the American roller coaster. After a fast rise to the very top, there was an even faster fall to the very bottom. By August of 2016, the young No Love was on a 10-fight winning streak with no losses. Half of these wins were earned in the local promotions, the rest in the world's best league. On top of that, only one of the fights on his record went to a decision. In other words, at that moment, Cody Garbrandt was a perfect fit to be the main contender for the championship. On December the 30th, in the co-main event of the evening at UFC 207, the American prospect beat one of the greatest fighters in the face of Dominic Cruz and became the undisputed bantamweight champion. Already at 25, he achieved the dear dream of every mixed martial arts representative in the fighting industry with no exaggeration. It seemed that such a bright beginning would keep on going in the same manner However, that fire faded as quickly as it lightened up. The very first titled events against TJ Dillashaw, whom No Love clearly didn't like, resulted in a knockout already in the second round. You know, hats off to TJ. You know, he battled back, uh, you know, from losing his title and he was a hungry man, but I, I still am the better fighter in there and I'll show that in the rematch. An attempt to avenge the first career loss led to a first round TKO. After these two fights, Cody Garbrandt was never the same. In March of 2019, the American fighter lost to Pedro Munoz also in the first round. His chin couldn't take heavy shots any longer, and the mental state also left much to be desired. The next fight with Rafael Asuncao gave a little bit of hope for his comeback, but the subsequent losses to Rob Font and Kai Kara France only reaffirmed our speculations and left no doubts. Thus, the professional record of a young and talented former champion turned from 11-0 to 12-5. So, the chances for this guy's more or less adequate return are extremely low. Number 4. Ronda Rousey I had to beat this girl so thoroughly that there's no future girls that pick on my family in order to get a quicker title shot, you know? Pick on me all you want, but leave them out of it, and that's what I really want to accomplish. Ronda Rousey is one of the most successful women in the history of mixed martial arts. In fact, the American was relatively famous before performing in MMA. 
She had time to make a name for herself as a participant of the 2008 Olympics in Judo, where she won the bronze medal. Ronda began her fighting career in 2011. For a while, the American performed in strike force, and after it got closed down, she moved to the UFC where she achieved the most of her success. By the middle of 2015, Rousey was literally at the top of the world. The American scored finishes in all of her 13 fights, 12 submissions and one knockout. On top of that, Ronda Rousey was the bantamweight champion of the UFC with six title defenses. And if you add the fact that only one of her fights lasted longer than one round, while the last three bouts lasted 64 seconds in total, that begged the question, can anybody beat this machine? Ronda was a firm believer in her own invincibility, while the public opinion only boosted her ego. However, everything changed in November of 2015. The next contender in the face of Holly Holm, who was a boxing champion in the past, happened to be that very kryptonite for the undefeated champion. Ronda's arrogance and blatant underestimation of her opponent began long ago before the fight was even put together. At the stare down, Rousey always tried to convince Holm, like she convinced herself, that she has no chances to win. And prior to the actual fight, already in the octagon, she refused to touch gloves with her. As a result, she paid a huge price for her overconfidence. In the beginning of the second round, Holly Holm stopped Rousey by a devastating TKO, and the most damage was dealt to her ego. This shock had a great impact on the further life of the American. Her last fight on December 30th of 2016 was even shorter. It was all over in the first minute of the first round. After that, Ronda Rousey couldn't bear that and announced her retirement. Eventually, she had to deal with severe mental laceration and suicidal thoughts. However, over time, she moved to pro wrestling, where she continues to perform till this day. I don't even think she wants to fight. I, I mean, I think that. at a certain point in time, you have enough money in the bank, you have enough notoriety and fame, yeah. and she's got a lot of aspirations outside the sport. She's married now. Who knows? She might want to start a family. You're right. Number five, Luke Rockhold. All I care is I got the belt and I got the W in it and new. The fighting path of Luke Rockhold could very well have its own place among the greatest MMA representatives in the world's best promotion. If it wasn't for Michael Bisping, a source very close to the UFC that shall remain nameless um, gave me some information. Luke says that he's on a different level to everybody else and that he's by far the best fighter and he can destroy anybody and this, that and the other. Well, if that is the case, then it turns out that he's a liar because the guy has a bit of vagina inside him because he turned down uh, Ronaldo, Jacare, whatever his name is. He turned the fight down. I didn't turn this fight down. Two weeks, two days, two hours. I don't care. I'll take on anyone, anytime, any place. Certainly this asshole. Luke Rockhold's championship ambition, despite his lack of ability to promote fights, was always compensated by persistent training and skills in the cage. By December of 2015, the American fighter achieved his dream and became the UFC middleweight champion. He faced a lot of worthy opponents on his way, including the Count himself, and Rockhold beat all of them quite convincingly. But when it came to Luke's first title defense and the Brit expressed his desire to step in on a short notice and fight him for the second time, everything went south. Starting from the press conference where Beast being verbally destroyed the champion and ending with a fight itself when the confused American got knocked out in the very first round. That was the moment when Luke Rockhold's career began to go downhill. After the second fight with Michael Bisping, the American fighter was no longer the same. The only victory he got was in September of 2017 against David Branch. However, after that he went on a losing streak. Nothing helped Luke. Not new methods of training, nor the change of the weight class or a three-year long layoff. The last appearance of Luke took place in October of 2020 when he went up against Polo Costa. The fight itself was quite exciting, but not because of the dominance or skills of Rockhold he was known for in the past. Luke simply grew old. That's why he announced his retirement in the post-fight interview. Number 6. Marlon Morales uh, First of all guys, 
I want to thank everyone here. This is not an easy sport, you know? And I think I, I, I score more, and it is what it is. If Dana and Shelby, they think they want to run this again, I'm now for a big fight, you know? Uh, I just have opportunity to fight for the belt. If they think I'll deserve a rematch, I'll give him a rematch right away, we fight again. Marlon Morales is a tough Brazilian that terrorized the bantamweight division of the world's best league for a long time. Or more so, this guy consistently treated the fans with flashy highlights in the promotion called WSOF, which actually drew the attention from UFC matchmakers in the first place. Despite a rather unsuccessful debut, the Brazilian fighter soon went on to have a four-fight winning streak including the win over the current champion in the face of Aljamain Sterling. It seemed like the guy could be recognized as the new version of Jose Aldo and that he was ready for a title opportunity. Being the number one contender, Moraes went straight for Henry Cejudo, who was the double champion at that moment. By that time, the champion already beat TJ Dillashaw and was about to give him a chance for a rematch. However, the disqualification of the latter changed the initial plans and the Brazilian got his chance. The fighters faced each other on June the 8th of 2019 in the main event of the evening at UFC 238. As history has taught us, that moment marked the beginning of a fast and irrevocable decline in the professional career of Marlon Moraes. After TKO loss in the title fight, the Brazilian prospect wanted to return to the win column. He went up against the King of Rio and managed to snatch the victory in the very close fight, even though it was not easy. However, when he went on a notorious streak of stoppage losses in the first round, first to Corey Sanhagen, then Rob Font, Marab Dvalishvili, and finally Song Yadong. The last fight happened on March the 12th of 2022, and after four consecutive losses, Morales decided to call it quits and left the UFC announcing his retirement. A couple of months later, Marlon figured that it was too early to leave and debuted in the PFL season's finale on November the 25th. His countryman, Shaman Morales, finished him via TKO already in the beginning of the third round. I feel sorry for this guy, he had all the potential to have a successful and bright career, but one single loss crushed everything in a blink of an eye. Number 7. Alexander Gustafsson like you had like one of the most spectacular fights with John Jones, I mean down to the wire, like as, as close as it gets. And when you get out of a fight like that where you almost won the title against the greatest of all time. Like what is what is that feeling like, and where do you go from there? Uh, I, I, you know, it was tough. It was really tough because, you know, everybody was saying like, "You winning this fight? You winning this fight? You had three rounds against him. Like you winning this fight? Like it, it felt like, like you said, it was on. It was just, it was just right there at the goal line. I, you know, I didn't really pass that goal line at all. Um, I just felt like that uh, it, it was tough it was tough seems like the career of one of the former best light heavyweights on the planet alexander gustafson finally came to an end and not that long ago in december of 2018 the swede fought for the championship even though he lost to john jones via three round knockout but first things first in september of 2013 the mauler faced john jones at ufc 165 on that night, he delivered the best performance he possibly could and perhaps even won the fight. At least that's what the fans believe until this day. But in reality, Bones won via unanimous decision and defended his title. Such a close clash, which also took a lot of health from the Swede. Couldn't help but have an impact on his mental state. After the win over Jimmy Manua, in March of 2014, Gustafsson returned to the winning path. And in fact, it seemed like he still had it. But the very next clash with Anthony Johnson, where the Mauler lost via TKO in the first round, had an even greater effect on his condition. Eight months later, Alexander ultimately got his second title opportunity. He shared the cage with Daniel Cormier in the main event of the evening at UFC 192. And again, history repeated itself. He lost to DC in an extremely close fight though by a split decision. 
Even two subsequent wins over Jan Blakovic and Glover Teixeira did not change the situation. As history has taught us, even John Jones defeated Mola via three-round stoppage. Already by that moment, the Mauler was only a shadow of who he once was. The last episode especially affected a once elite light heavyweight. The Swedish fighter retired and came back again numerous times, only to lose even faster with every fight. Anthony Smith needed 22 minutes to get the job done, Fabricio Wardham two and a half minutes and Nikita Krylov only one minute and seven seconds. Sadly, but the current situation indicated only one thing. It is the end of Alexander Gustafsson's career. Because the Swedish fighter is already 36 and there are no chances that he can overcome such a severe decline. Yes, recently there were many examples when even older fighters continue to successfully perform. But something tells us that the Vikings case is not one of them. The loss in the first fight with John Jones heavily affected him, which is very sad. However, the most devastating shock for him was the realization that he was literally one step away from achieving the most coveted dream of his life, and in the end, he failed to do so. The Mauler couldn't show his best in the subsequent title opportunities and drove into the sunset on a losing streak. Number 8. Jose Aldo Yeah, that's uh, the, the emotional side of fighting, like the emotional side of losses. Like when you see guys just weeping in their locker room. And like, remember, <clears throat> the, the hardest one for me was Aldo after McGregor knocked him out. Mm. And he was just in his locker room just weeping like, God damn that dude. As we mentioned in one of the recent videos about the greatest fighters in history, the professional career of Jose Aldo can be rightfully recognized as one of the best. That guy dominated in the world's best league for more than 10 years and held the championship. Every athlete knew the name of the King of Rio and unwittingly shook in his presence. The Brazilian featherweight terrorized the entire division for a very long time and these are not just words. Things went their way until one Irish guy came into the game. Have you spoken to this guy? Of course I have spoken to him. I've spoken to him many times. What you know, he does him? not speak English, so I looked him dead in the eye and I said, Uva morrer, which means you will die in oh his own God. language. Oh I'm Portuguese. His Yo, bottom lip chills. quivered. Yo. His eyes watered. And that was it. He walked off, we He's walked scared? off, and that is it. Of course Wait, he is can scared. you say it again one more time? Uva morrer. <laughs> After the title fight with Conor McGregor at UFC 194 and those 13 seconds, Jose Aldo ultimately couldn't come back to the previous level. An overconfident and arrogant aura of the notorious one took the soul of the King of Rio and changed him. No doubt about that. Max Holloway also added the oil to the fire. He stopped the Brazilian via TKO twice. Since then, Jose began to perform with mixed success until he finally decided to retire after his loss to Murab Dvalishvili in August of 2022. Fortunately, over time, Aldo managed to recalibrate and had a successful debut in professional boxing. But the fact remains the same. After the fight with Connor, he lost his soul and began to decline. Number 9. Tony Ferguson Where you at, McNugget, you piece of I'm gonna kick your ass! Khabib don't do it, I will! Son of a bitch! I'll give you a proper ass whooping any day! The Mexican El Cucuy, or simply a boogeyman, Tony Ferguson can be rightfully recognized as one of the most talented and vivid performers, as well as one of the unluckiest. In just one year, the career of the American with Mexican roots turned 180 degrees. In May of 2020, Tony was on a 12-fight winning streak and hadn't lost in almost eight years. He was supposed to have his fifth attempt to fight Habib Nurmagomedov for the title. However, the plans got interfered with the pandemic. The Degestani's refusal to fight and Justin Gaethje, who agreed to step in on a short notice. For a once major butcher of the world's best league, everything resulted in a vicious beating and a TKO in the fifth round. The loss to the highlight could be accounted for by overconfidence. Two weight cuts in a short period of time and the fact that Tony trained for a different opponent with a completely different fighting style. 
but the following losses in the fight with Charles Oliveira and Benil Dariush clearly showed that Tony Ferguson was in a crisis as he lost those fights with no chances. The only thing that remained from the bloodthirsty El Kukui was his power of will that did not let him tap due to the submissions, which in fact looked even more miserable because it seemed that a little bit more and Tony would simply get his hand or leg broken. A small fraction of hope shined in the first round with Michael Chandler, however it was less of the former Tony than the Iron One systematic mistakes, which Tony properly capitalized on. But all doubts ultimately disappeared when El Kukui decided to come back to welterweight, where he lost to the veteran in Nate Diaz via guillotine in the fourth round. Now it was finally clear that Tony Ferguson is never going to be a contender again or even be competitive. Well, why do we feel so humanly sorry for Ferguson in this whole situation? Because he most likely lost to far the time, not the opponents or himself. Tony is 39 right now, at such an age only a few athletes compete in lightweight classes where speed, endurance and reaction are very essential factors. In fact, the UFC sacrificed Ferguson for the sake of McGregor and Habib. Nobody spoke up for me to get a title fight with 12 fight win streak. Here's in the making. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Step on somebody's toes? Did I speak up for myself? I was so bad, right? This is funny to me. Number 10, Rory McDonald. You mentioned <laughs> another uh, fight that we've all seen as fans. And I knew when I watched him at Bellator that he wasn't the same guy anymore. And that's Rory McDonald. Yeah. And now he's in the PFL looking for answers that aren't there anymore. On August the 13th of 2022, Rory McDonald lost in the PFL Grand Prix semi-finals with a prize of $1 million. He was defeated by a first round TKO by Delano Taylor, who stepped in on short notice. And right after that, McDonald left the fighting sport. Rory couldn't become a UFC champion. The only thing he managed to do is to snatch the title in Bellator. However, he was the one to participate in the fight that went down in the world history of the entire mixed martial arts. Many recognize his rematch with Robbie Lawler as not just the best fight of 2015, but of all time. They fought on the same card with Conor McGregor, who just came to the world's best league and managed to overshadow the Irishman. The first fight between McDonald and Lawler took place in 2013 in a three-round format. Back then, Robbie won via split decision, while Rory returned to the drawing board and began a new journey to the second title opportunity. On his way, McDonald got rid of Damian Mayer, Tyron Woodley and Tarek Safadeen to become the number one contender for the title. And on July the 11th of 2015 in the co-main event of the evening at UFC 189, the promotion set up a rematch. It was one of those fights where you really felt the heat of the battle. There wasn't much time to think, it was just all reaction and letting your training come out. It was a crazy experience, um, but that's why I feel I gained so much composure from that fight because it was the craziest fight I've ever been. The athletes fought till the bitter end. They gave everything they had, including the heart and will. This brawl is forever in the history as one of the most breathtaking and spectacular wars inside the octagon. It gave us as many emotions in its time during the first watch as it took health and life from Rory. And, uh... I remember him being intense. I remember his energy. He was like, he wanted to kill me. I remember when he, he looked at me. I've seen him in other fights. He stares people down like that and he intimidates them. But I don't like being intimidated by people. Even, even though I was gassed and I, all I wanted to do was sit on that bench, <laughs> uh, I wasn't gonna let him just walk all over me, you know, like stare me down and make me go sit down on a bench like a bitch. So I was gonna stay there as long as I had to until the ref separated it. And uh, that's what I did. I was on my way back to turn. I seen he was doing that to me, so I turned back around with whatever energy I had to, you know, to give it right back. 
The guys put on a show, they gave it all and put on such a spectacle that is unlikely to be topped by anyone in the near future. It's a shame that Rory McDonald began to gradually decline, but if you think about it, it couldn't be the other way. Not many people can remain themselves after they go through the same stuff that guy had to. There it is guys, leave your opinions in the comments below. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you won't miss the new videos. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this one. And that's it for today. See you soon.